I see love unchained, justice met, mercy claimed. And then I cry, what wonderful grace, what wonderful grace. The message of grace is brought to you by Christian people who believe the Bible to be the Word of God and who appreciate its power and authority. Within the pages of the Bible itself, there's a God-given design for its study. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth is the key to understanding the Bible. We're glad you've joined us for an interesting look into God's infallible book as Richard Jordan, President of Grace School of the Bible, presents another in a series of messages designed to help you understand and enjoy the Bible. Let's join him now. We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we look again into the pages of the Scripture to allow the God of the Bible to teach us out of His Word. You know, it's extremely important to understand that the God of creation, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And who that God is, uh, I had a young man write me recently and he, he, uh, he said, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting a little concerned. He said, my, I hear all the adults around me talking about they know that God is real. He said, the only way I know God's real is because the Bible says He is. And I just have faith in the Bible. And, and is that enough? <laughs> and that's a good question. You know, there are two ways you know God is real. Number one, Romans chapter 1 says that by the, the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood. His eternal power and His God in every person just from the creation knows that there's a God, there's a creator. I mean, you have to, your existence proves there's a God. In philosophy, they call it the first cause. That is, who is the, where did, where did everything come from? It had, everything had to have a first cause. Every effect has a cause. We understand that. Physics tells you that. Philosophy tells you that. Well, then what was the first cause? A couple of years ago, Ben Stein had this movie that he did called Expel, where he was, went around the country and demonstrated that if you, if you believe in creationism, as Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, that you get expelled from academia in our day. And he took some of the world's leading atheists and he talked to them about, well, what do you think about intelligent design and you think about these things? And he began to ask the question, well, where did, where did everything come from? Where did life come from? And one of the leading proponents, one of the leading 20, 20th and 21st century atheists, famous around the world, wrote books, I've read them. He said, well, maybe life came from aliens from space that deposited life on planet Earth. <laughs> and, you know, you kind of go, intelligent people actually believe that? <laughs> And you, you know, you'd think it was a joke, but that didn't help. Because the question, if alien life put life on planet Earth and created human life, where'd the aliens come from? See, that's the question. Well, logic, your mind tells you, your existence tells you, unless this is a, a big illusion, that there had to be a first cause. So just creation tells you that there's a God. And if there's a God, then you know instinctively by virtue of the fact that he's put his, that knowledge in your heart that you're going to face him in judgment. So Romans 1.20 is very clear. Every person knows just from the creation about you. One, there's a God. And two, you're going to face him in, in judgment. What Romans 1 goes on in verse 21 and following tell you is that people don't like that. And so they, professing themselves to be wise, they become foolish. <laughs> And they developed excuses to get around God. They developed religion and rationalism and so on and so forth to reject what they know in their heart. So I wrote that young man back and I says, well, you know this is God just because you exist. Existence tells you that there had to be, creation tells you there had to be a creator. But it doesn't tell you who God is. The fact that you know there's a God, the Bible says the devils believe, there's one, you believe there's one God, the devils believe and tremble. Just to know there's a God isn't enough. You need to know Him. And that's the whole scope of the Bible. Because the Bible doesn't just say, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. After God created it, got a problem showed up. 
And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And when God wanted to move in His creation, Genesis 1-3 said, says, And He said, Let there be light. Now people get all focused on what He said, Let there be light. I want you to see, He said. When God originally, three verses in the Bible, Number one, you learn there's a God. Number two, you learn there's a problem in the creation that He made. And number three, you learn that when God wants to work in His creation, He speaks. You see, the way you know there's a God is just by looking around you and letting the testimony of creation tell you there has to be a Creator. But the way you're going to know who the Creator is is through His Word when He speaks. There are three great what are called monotheistic religions in the world. Most religions in the world are either pantheistic or polytheistic. That is, they believe that there's a lot of gods and different kinds and shapes. But the three great world religions that are monotheistic believe in one God. The first one is Judaism. The second one is Christianity. And then the third one, and I'm giving them to you in the historical order of development, the third one is, is Islam. And those three great religions, the great profession of the nation Israel, Jesus quoted it in Mark chapter 12, and uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, there is one God. One God. That is, there's only one supreme. You can't have five supreme. You can only be one God. Now, the Christian doctrine is that there's one God in three persons. <laughs> now, what happens with Judaism and Islam, they come along and say, well, when you believe in the Trinity, you really believe in three gods. That's one of the ways you can know that uh, Judaism and, Christ and, and, and Islam are, are wrong. People say, I, somebody says, well, why don't you trust the Quran? Well, I don't trust books that have mistakes on them that prove themselves to have mistakes. I don't mean that I say how, but that say, that themselves do. You go through the Quran and it tells you that, the, that, that Christians believe in three gods. Christians have never believed in three gods. The Apostle Paul says, 1 Timothy 2, there is one God. I mean, how hard is that to get? And one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The Bible over and over says there's one God. No Christian, going by the Bible, would ever believe there are more than one God. But what Christians do acknowledge, and what the Jewish Bible and the Islamic Bible acknowledge, is that there's more than one person in the Godhead. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible talks about, God says, let us go and make man. Well, when he says, let us, I don't say that. I say, I'll go do this, I'll go do that. When I say, let us, that's people talking to one another. So the, even in the Jewish Bible, in Genesis 1, you have God, one God, talking to the other persons of the Godhead. By the way, the Quran has Allah doing exactly the same thing. There are time and again in the, in the surahs in, in, in the Quran where Allah will say, let us, we do this, and speak in the plural. And that's not an editorial we. That's not some kind of a mythological kind of a, of, of a uh, terminology. You, that's God, the Godhead, talking. Well, if Judaism and Islam don't recognize the, pra the plurality of persons in the Godhead, that's on them, okay? But their own scriptures indicate that they are. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity is the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible is that there's one God in three persons. An illustration of that would be that in this room where I'm teaching right now, or just take where you're watching the, the program, you're watching and I'm watching. That's at least two people, right? Now there's one humanity. You share, you share humanity. You're a human, I'm a human. There's only one humanity. But look at all the people that make up humanity. In essence and being, we're one. 
God has made all men of one blood, all men on the face of the earth. You can take blood out of one out of one person, one one ethnic group, one social group, one religious group, one status, any, any human. As long as it's the same blood type, put it in another person, they'll work. You can take an organ. Man in our assembly in Chicago has got a liver transplant, a lung transplant. <laughs> another guy got a heart transplant. You can actually take parts out of people and put them in other people. We can share the physical creation. Why? Because we have a common humanity. And yet we're all distinct people. Now that's a poor illustration, but it makes my point. One in essence in being. One in, God, in, in the Godhead. But three in people. There's God the Father. He's God. There's God the Son. He's called God. And there's God the Holy Spirit. Each one of them share the essence of deity. But they are three in persons. Ephesians chapter number 1. Verse 3, Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Notice there's the God and Father. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1 says it this way. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So there is God the Father, but God the Son, Jesus Christ, John chapter number 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, back in Genesis 1, 1, was the Word. If you look at it, you'll see it's with a capital W. That's a proper name. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Now think about that. If I'm with you, that means you're there and I'm here. There's two people. You're not with yourself, you're with someone else. <laughs> so you have more than one person, so you can have a with relationship. And then it says the word was God. You have a being. Now who's the word? And by the way, he says, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So in the beginning, when God created the heaven and the earth, it's, this, it's the word that did the actual creating. One of the members of the Godhead is the one that goes out and speaks for the Godhead. Who is that? Verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwell among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's God the Son. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have God the Father. You have God the Son. Romans chapter number 9. How can you call the Father God and the Son God? They're two different people, but they share the same essence of deity. Colossians 2 verse 9 says that in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All of the essence of deity resides in the Father. All the essence of deity resides in the Son. But they're two different people in the Godhead. There are only three people in the Godhead. But there are three people. They're not three gods. There's only one God. Just like there's only one humanity. With a lot of different people populating humanity. There's only one deity. Only one Godhead. But three individual members in the Godhead. Only three, but three. Romans chapter 9, verse 5, talking about the, Lord, about the nation Israel, who are the fathers and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. In your Bible, come to Hebrews chapter 1. In your Bible, the apostles who knew the Lord Jesus Christ personally said He was God. The apostle Paul who met Him on the road to Damascus and communicated with Him from heaven said He was God. Hebrews 1, verse 8. Hebrews 1, 8. But unto the Son, he saith, here's God the Father talking to the Son, and he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Notice the Father calls the Son God. So don't get your, you know, your, 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 your wig in a knot when the Lord Jesus Christ is acknowledged in the Scripture to be God. What about the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse number 16. Paul says, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Paul thought the Holy Spirit was God. 
You're the temple of God. Who's dwelling in you? The Holy Spirit. Why? Because you're the temple of God. In Acts chapter 5, Peter talking to Ananias says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. And then he said, you lied to God. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Peter believe that God, the Holy Spirit, is the, that the Holy Spirit is God, is the third member of the Godhead. Now, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, what I, want, I, I, I go over that to say to you, The, the doctrine of the Trinity is at the very heart of the gospel message. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, God the Father, has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He, the Father, hath chosen us in Him before the world began, having predestinated us under the adoption of children. You see, the Father has a plan. Fundamental to understanding what, what the Bible teaches is that God the Father has a plan. And He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Before God set out and sent His Son to create the universe, the Father had a plan for what He was going to do with creation. If you come over to Titus chapter 1, verse number 2, In hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Here's a promise and a plan that the Father had before Genesis 1.1. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me. Back here, before the world began, God the Father had a plan. Before he ever created anything, he's got something he's going to do with creation. So when Jesus Christ stood there and created the heaven and the earth, he had a plan that the Father gave him to do. He was fulfilling the blueprint that the Father gave him. So in creation... It wasn't, it's not willing, you're not here today because of a willy-nilly happenstance of chance. God himself has a plan. And the plan of the Father had to do with providing eternal life to those who trusted his Son and to take those who believe and conform them to the glory of his image in the ages to come. If you look down at Ephesians 1, verse 9, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. <laughs> you see, he's got that plan back there that he has now revealed. Made known through preaching, committed to me, Paul says. What is it? That in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things which are in Christ, both which are in heaven and earth, even in him. God the Father's plan is to have all of his creation brought together under the headship of His Son. Now the reason for that, if you come to Ephesians 1 verse 7, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, so He says in verse 6, Ephesians 1 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He, that is the Father, hath made us accepted in the Beloved, that's God the Son, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, in whom we have redemption through His blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. What the Father planned, the Son comes and purchases. The key element in the Father's plan is the payment that was needed to bring peace, to bring His creation. You remember I said in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep? Well, God is light in whom there is no darkness at all. A darkness enveloped God's creation. It comes from sin. It comes because there was an adversary showed up in God's creation that wanted to usurp God's plan and purpose. Ezekiel 28 talks about him created in this exalted position but lifted up by pride. You know what the middle letter of the word pride is? It's the same as the middle letter of the word sin. 
And Ezekiel says he was perfect till the day that iniquity was found in him. He used the ability that God gave him to make choices to say, I think I'll be my own God. The great definition for sin in the Bible. People say, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't hang around with the folks that do. Well, that's not the definition of sin in the Bible. The Bible says, oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone into his own way. That desire to be your own God. The Frank Sinatra religion, I did it my way. You know what that is? That's rebellion. It's rebellion. Rebellion against God, against the Creator. I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to do it my Lift it up by pride. And you know what happened? He brought darkness. He brought foolishness. He brought the lie. That's why Colossians chapter 1 says in verse 13, that, that uh, we've been delivered for us from the power of darkness. And he's translated this into the kingdom of his own dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You see what Jesus Christ did when he went to Calvary? He made a payment at Calvary that allows God the authority to take you out of that kingdom of darkness and put you into his dear son. And so what the father planned, the son purchases. And the Son has made the payment that was necessary so the Father could carry out His plan without impugning His own character and without clearing the guilty and not dealing with sin. God has successfully dealt with the sin problem, with the guilt problem, with your failure problem. And Jesus Christ at Calvary paid for everything that's wrong with you so that he, taking away your sin, could give you his life and purpose. And then God the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1 verse 13, talking about the, when you trust Christ, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, unto the redemption of the purchased possession. What the Father planned, the Son made the payment that makes the Father's plan possible. And the Holy Spirit comes, and His work is to guarantee that the plan of the Father will be carried out. The Holy Spirit comes and makes us partakers of the life of the Father by placing us into the Lord Jesus Christ. When you, that's the reason it says what it does. After you've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation... Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You don't just decide to get saved. You hear, you hear the good news that Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again for you. He paid your sin debt so He could give you His life. The wage of sin is death, the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You hear that. You believe it. You trust it. You rely exclusively on what Christ did for you to be your Savior. When you do that, then... You're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise under the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit comes and takes you and takes you out of Adam and puts you into Christ, and then He seals you there. He makes us one with Christ. When He's made you complete in Christ, how'd you get into Christ? God, the Holy Spirit, by one Spirit, are we all baptized into one body. So the Holy Spirit seals us into Christ to keep us so we can't be taken out of Christ, and He does it until the day of redemption. Right down by Ephesians 1.14, Ephesians 4.30. He says, you're sealed until the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit guarantees that all those that trust Christ as their Savior will be presented to the Father in redeemed, glorified bodies ready to fulfill the will of the Father, and share in the glorification of the Son through all eternity. Now, I say all that. That's what Ephesians 1 talks about. You can't read the first 14 verses of Ephesians 1 and not see that the doctrine, the idea, the understanding of who the Godhead is. He's the Father. He's the Son. He's the Holy Spirit. The idea of the triunity the three persons in the Godhead working as one together. 
There's a great illustration of that back in the Old Testament. King David is at the, is at the cave of Adullam. Rejected and outcast. Longing, he says, for a drink of the water from the well at Bethlehem. His hometown. Did you ever get that way? Just wished you could go back and have that cool drink of water. Something just to satisfy that thirst, that itch in your soul. David had some mighty men that were there. Three of those mighty men hurt him. And Samuel, 2 Samuel says that they went as though they were one and got that water. Risked their own lives, brought the water, and gave it to David. Those three men, when they acted in union together, in unison, they had one purpose together. They acted as one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit worked together in one cause to accomplish the will of the Father. All of the God... Listen, when the Bible says God is for you, it says the Father is for you, it says Christ is for you, it says the Holy Spirit is for you. You need to understand the Godhead is on your side. At the heart of what the Bible teaches is for you to know the triune God. And by the way, the fact that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they forever have been in fellowship with one another. And what eternal life is, is them inviting you and I to come and fellowship with them. Not a holy other that can't be related to, but the whole purpose of the Trinity is to show you that the way God created life in His creation is to be life in a relationship with Him. Well, our time's gone. Till next time, Maranatha.